Well, hi there, and welcome on this new episode of Alpinography, the biography of impactful mountaineers that are rather unknown to the general public. Without a pause, let's jump straight ahead in today's topic and talk about a climber whose inventions changed the face of the world. Let me present you Pierre Allen and the revolution he brought to rock climbing. Pierre Allen? Really? Pierre and Allen? He doesn't have a family name? Uh, so yes, he does. Pierre is his first name, and Alan, with an I and two L's, is his family name. So PA, that's his initials, revolutionized the world of rock climbing and mountaineering at the beginning of the 1930s thanks to the invention of many tools still widely used nowadays, and not just in the mountains. Here, for example, the down jacket that you wear during winter. It's a rather handy attire, yet a quite common one as well. Well, that's him. It is him! thanks to his mountaineering experience, who invented that. And guess what else? Against all odds, that man, who changed the face of rock climbing and mountaineering forever in the entire world, is a Parisian, a pure city guy. That's right, there's no need to be born in the hearts of mountains in order to love them. Hashtag mountains are for everyone. If you like to climb rocks, you might actually have already heard his name somewhere, but probably not his story. Pierre Allen was born in Paris in 1904 and only discovered mountains in 1923 when he went to the French Alps for the very first time. He is thus only 19 years old when he suddenly falls in love with mountain hiking. He'll have to wait until 1928 before a friend called Maurice Payon introduces him to boulder climbing in the Parisian suburb, since that's where he lives, of Fontainebleau. Fontainebleau? So we call it just Blow in the climbing world. So Blow and rock climbing have a deep relationship. For those that don't know it, they are in the Fontainebleau surroundings, thousands of sandstone boulders of all different shapes and form ready to be climbed. If at the beginning of the 1900s there were only a dozen climbers that were interested by the challenge, the area is now globally known and recognized as a boulder climbing hotspot. For that matter, nowadays, the climbing grade named Fontainebleau to indicate a boulder's difficulty has become a worldwide standard. If for example I tell you that I can climb 7A in bouldering, climbers from around the world, well, except North America, will know what my level is. In short, it's there, at Blow, at the age of 24, that Pierre Allen discovers rock climbing. And it will still take him another two years to get into mountaineering. So yeah, what's important to understand is that when we talk about rock climbing, it's an activity that involves only the ascent of rocks free from all other elements. Alpinism, aka mountaineering, is more an activity as a whole. It's an activity that usually happens in an alpine environment, above treeline, and that embraces rock climbing, ice climbing, hiking on glaciers, and snowy summits all together. You probably recognize the word Alps in alpinism, and that's what's involved here. The Alps have very different summits from one another in terms of shapes and height, but for the highest and sharpest ones, one must usually know how to climb rocks as well as hike on glaciers filled with crevasses. One can be a pure rock climber without ever touching the world of mountaineering. The opposite is rarely true. If you're still a little bit confused, do not worry. I'll do a bonus episode on alpinism and its history that I'll release really soon. If Raymond Lambert from our first episode was a pure alpinist, Pierre Allen clearly enjoyed climbing rocks only. But what's also interesting in Pierre Allen's story is the understanding that it's never too late. It's never too late to learn, it's never too late to discover a new passion, and it's never too late to become the man that revolutionized modern climbing. Besides turning out to be an amazing climber, Pierre Allen also liked to devote time on gear preparation. In 1930, for his very first alpine climb on one of the faces of the Parachet Tooth, a 12,140 feet summit in the French Alps, him and his rope partners get caught up in bad weather as they are coming back down and they are forced to find shelter in a crevasse. With his three friends, he'll spend the night there in that very narrow space, completely wet, chilled to the bones, shivering like a madman in his heel-suited clothing. 
At that moment, he swears that if he makes it out alive, he'll develop warm bivouac gear and clothes in order to avoid such pleasant experiences ever again. It is important to remember what climbers were dealing with in the 1930s. Back then, I already mentioned it in the previous episode, one would climb with nothing else but a cotton shirt, a hemp jacket, and maybe a light wool sweater. Can you believe that? I mean, truthfully, I challenge anyone to climb a summit above 13,000 feet in bad weather with nothing but a cotton shirt. And don't forget the cufflinks. Anyways, traumatized by this experience that should have transformed him into an ice cube, he'll start working on multiple solutions. And in 1933, he'll come up with a revolutionary piece of clothing. The down jacket. How crazy is that? The down jacket that you wear because climber or not, we all have a down jacket nowadays. May you live in a city or be a mountaineer in the Himalayas or a soldier deployed in the Arctic. We all have a down jacket. May it be feathers or synthetic field. He is the one that invented that in the middle of the 1930s. And that, well, there's not a lot of people that know about it. That item of clothing is revolutionary because it allows heat conservation and thus enables you to resist longer in cold weather. Throw a thin jacket on top of it for waterproofing and windbreaking, and you're unstoppable. It is actually thanks to that down jacket that two years later, in 1935, he will successfully make the first ascent with his companion Raymond Lenager of the north face of Les Drues in the Chamonix Valley. And again, if you've listened to the first episode, you'll know what I'm talking about. What's important to know is that at that time, no one thought the north face of Les Drues was doable. Besides being considered to be very difficult rock climbing, the whole experience was described as too long, too cold, and too dangerous. One had to do the ascent with a lot of gear in order to bivouac multiple nights, as well as to protect themselves against the ever-changing weather from the mountains. Because of that, backpacks would become so heavy to be properly carried that climbers needed even more time to climb. In other words, the longer a route takes to climb, the more gear you need, and the more gear you need, the longer a route takes to climb. Well, thanks to his down jacket, Pierre Allen managed to cross the too cold part of the ascent. In case of bad weather or drop of temperatures, climbers wouldn't need to seek shelter and could keep on with the climbing. Thanks to that, the climbing length, time-wise, became much shorter. His second genius stroke was the invention of the light carabiner with sprung gate. At that time, carabiners, invented only 20 years before that by the German climber Dulfer, is heavy, almost 200 grams, aka 7 ounces per piece, oval, and without any springs to prevent it from opening itself all of a sudden. PA, constantly looking for optimization, decides to manufacture carabiners himself with the machine he built himself that are asymmetrical, which increases its resistance in case of a fall, with sprung gate and using aluminum alloy. With that, the carabiner now only weighs 65 grams, 2.3 ounces, and is incredibly easy to use. Just imagine, with these new carabiners, if a rob crew of two carries 10 quick draws each, knowing that a quick draw is made of two carabiners, in the end, you only carry 2.6 kilos, 91 ounces, instead of eight, eight, that's 282 ounces. Thanks to the drop in weight combined with the new piece of clothing he invented, Pierre Allen just changed the face of rock climbing. By reducing the weight climbers have to carry and by allowing them to keep on climbing despite cold weather, PA just decreased the time it takes to climb a route. And since the climbing time is reduced, it's pointless to carry heavy loads for multiple bivouacs, meaning the backpack becomes lighter, meaning the climbing time decreases even more. Considered as mentally disabled by the locals for wanting to climb that daunting north face of Edru when he's just a Parisian, Pierre Allen has to find his rope partner Raymond Leninger within the group of climbers from Fontainebleau because no one else wants to take that risk. In reality, it's true luck for Pierre Allen because it is thanks to their climbing skills so particular to Fontainebleau that they'll manage to overcome the biggest obstacles. At Blow, a lot of boulders are either smooth or cracked, forcing the local climbers to develop two climbing techniques. The layback technique to crack climb and the smearing slash palming technique to slab climb. 
These movements had never been used on mountains before because they were considered to be acrobatic circus techniques and not the pure alpine way. Well, it is thanks to these techniques, combined with light and resistant gear, that three days after the aborted try from the magnificent Raymond Lambert, Pierre Allen, along with Raymond Leninger, touches the summit of Les Drues and silence all his critics at the same time. One of the best alpinists that ever existed, Walter Bonatti, so remember that name for a future episode, will even say Pierre Allen and Raymond Leninger have solved one of the most important and most disputed problems of modern alpinism. The conquest of this phase has set an important milestone in history of alpinism. Again, there's no need to be born at the foot of the slopes to love mountains. As long as you respect them and don't pollute them, mountains are for everyone. Oh yeah, and FYI, the smearing and laybacking technique are nowadays considered to be 101 rock climbing techniques. Learning how friction and opposition work when rock climbing is now just the most basic thing. After this resounding success, PA is going to clean out French mountains. Between 1935 and 1940, he will realize 25 first ascents on faces that were thought to be unreachable. 25! Just to compare, in the life of a professional climber, making one or two first ascents is already quite an accomplishment. Amongst all his firsts, there's the south face of La Meige, a nice 800 meter face, 2600 feet, that he finished in just 8 hours, which is still, nowadays, 70 years later, considered as a normal time for that route. To better visualize this achievement, the 800 meters of Les Drues had still taken him two full days. What's important not to forget either is that PA is not a mountain professional, he isn't a guide, he lives and works in Paris and only goes after routes when he has free time. During that same period of time, in 1936, PA is invited to participate to the very first French expedition in the Himalayas with the aim of climbing the Hidden Peak, known today as the Gasherbrum 1, in the Karakoram. FYI, Gasherbrum in the local dialect means beautiful mountain. Despite having just opened a little climbing shop in the heart of Paris, PA leaves everything behind to join this amazing experience. Back then, crossing the 500 kilometers 300 miles, that separated Srinagar in today's disputed region of Kashmir from the Hidden Speak base camp took them a total of 40 days, including 30 days of nothing but walking. To that needs to be added one week of transportation from Mumbai to Srinagar and two weeks of boat from Marseille to Mumbai. Today, this would take a day of plane travel, one day of bus, one day of 4x4, and six days of hiking. So nine days total, instead of the 61 days it took back in 1936. And that's just to reach the base camp. Unfortunately for this very first French expedition, the monsoon came a few weeks earlier that year, and not a single person managed to reach the summit because of bad weather. Only P.A. and Jean Leninger, the brother of Raymond Leninger, managed to reach the altitude of 6,850 meters, aka 22,500 feet, an absolute French record at the time. Thrilled to have been part of this expedition, P.A. is even more so to come back to the French Alps where he can dedicate himself to pure rock climbing and not just mountaineering. He'll never have any regrets about their defeat on the Gasherbrum 1. No, what he'll consider like his first, and even only, big failure is the northeast face of the Grand Jorasse, the last untouched route in the Chamonix Valley that he will fail to conquer in 1938 because of bad weather. A few days later only after his attempt, the spur got climbed by an Italian rock crew while still requiring them 72 hours of hard battle. Even though competition is of no interest to him, this defeat will leave him with the bitter taste and he'll keep blaming himself for not having pushed further. He will still vocally state that it is important to sometimes turn around when the elements order you to do so and it is pure wisdom to simply obey and not rush headfirst into death as a sacrifice to pride and ego. 
He'll try his luck again in 1945 before finally reaching the summit via that spur in 1946 with his third try. There. So now you're probably telling yourself, alright, based on the tone of his voice, we're reaching the end of the episode and its conclusion. Well, not at all. And if you're a bit into rock climbing history, you'll probably know we're still missing info on PA's biggest invention. In 1945, PA helps with the liberation of Chamonix from the Nazis and at the same time stops focusing on mountain ascents in order to spend most of his time on innovations for the rock climbing community. From his small Parisian workshop, Pierre Allen is going to come up with two new more revolutionary items. The first one is the rappel device in order to slide the back down a rope. What you should know is that before this invention, in order to quickly come back down from the face of a mountain, climbers would do so with their body directly on the rope, making it go through their thighs and their neck for friction. The result? Guaranteed burn marks and very probable lethal falls. PA comes up with what he'll call a rappel device. A little piece of equipment to which the climber clips on and then makes the rope go through in order to rappel down in safety and with no burns. Today, no one, I say again, no one, rock climbs without a belaying slash rappel device. Well, when PA invented that in the middle of the 1940s, people just laughed out loud, considering it like a pointless item. It is only around the 1960s that people finally decided to use it extensively before finally becoming an essential, mandatory, crucial item. Then came 1948 with the new genius move from Pierre Allen. He's going to create what a lot of people still keep calling PAs for Pierre Allen, the rock climbing shoe. That's right, the rock climbing shoe, that item that no climber can do without nowadays. He's the one that invented that. Before 1948, alpinists would use either big studded hiking boots or flat sneakers with hand soles. Well, good luck climbing with that. Pierre Allen comes up with a flexible slipper with a resin sole dedicated solely to rock climbing. It is a revolution that gives rock climbers the much needed support and friction and allows them to suddenly climb routes that were previously considered to be just impossible. No, but wait, the rock climbing shoe is the invention of the millennium in the mountain world. The space rockets are to the conquest of the moon what the rock climbing shoes are to the conquest of rocky mountains. In a blink of an eye, people realize that climbing without rock climbing shoes, well, it's like jumping on a trampoline without a trampoline. It's kinda easier with. So, just a small digression here for those that love to be fussy about timelines and inventions. You should know that for Pierre Allen, the idea of a rock climbing shoe actually started back in 1930. He even wore a prototype for his ascent of Les Drues in 1935. Without any links between themselves at first glance, some Italians, including a certain Vitale Bramani, founder of a world-renowned sole company nowadays, decide to also improve soles of mountain shoes, but specifically for hiking boots, not climbing. And that around 1937 with some sort of uh, tire slash rubber. Believe me, we'll talk about the revolutionizing idea in a future episode. But it's clearly PA who in 1948, big pause between his prototype and the final version due to the war, who invented the true rock climbing shoe. Because Pierre Allen never trademarked his invention, his idea was copied by the entire industry and he received little appraisal for his work and research. PA, in love with mountains above anything else, doesn't really care. What he enjoys is to give life to innovations and seeing them being improved afterwards. In any event, if his own brand of rock climbing shoes sell pretty well at the beginning, the rough business competition quickly puts an end to it. There you go. I found it important to remind everyone that this piece of equipment nowadays being used all around the world was originally a nice invention from a kind, crafty and good climber Parisian. PA finally moved to the Alps in 1963 at the age of 59 and continued for the rest of his life to manufacture, still by himself and with his own machine, up to 30,000 carabiners per year. He passed away on December 19th of 2000 at Saint-Martin-du-Riac. Amongst all his inventions, he also came up with, well, every derivative from his down jacket, including the down sleeping bag, yeah, that's him also, 
the downed balaclava and the downed elephant's foot. As well as the unhooker, a now unused item because potentially dangerous, that allowed climbers to rappel down the rope without having to fix it or tie it. From its Parisian friends, Climber from Blow, we also owe them the rope made in nylon by Laurent Chevalier, and it's important to note that 99% of today's climbing rope are made of nylon, and the climbing ascender in order to climb up a rope by Henri Bruneau. There you go, in my mind it was important to do an alpinography on Pierre Allen, a climber gifted as much for climbing rocks than for manufacturing gear, whose inventions allowed the climbing world and the mountaineering world to enter a new era. If you want to learn more about that man, well, you'll need to speak French because none of his books or books about him have been translated. But just in case, here are a few. Alpinisme et Compétition by Pierre Allen. Alpinisme, la saga des inventions et des techniques by Gio Modica. As well as the video La Lumière du Rocher, a documentary from Laurent Chevalier on Pierre Allen. There you go. Thank you for listening and I will see you real soon for a new episode. Bye!